At this time, Colombia calls in its correspondents in the belligerent capitals of Europe for less news on the diplomatic, economic, and battle fronts. Italy is claiming big victories in British Somaliland. German warplanes are reportedly continuing their raids over Britain today after the lull of yesterday. And in Berlin, the German government has warned the United States against letting the army transport American Legion pass through the waters near the British Isles. Germany said she would not be responsible for what happened if the vessel did not change its course. The American Legion, you know, is carrying 897 war refugees from Patesimo, Finland, to New York. But despite the German warning, the State Department in Washington announced that the ship will not change its course. And now, news direct from Europe. But first, the report of Edwin Hartridge. Go ahead, Berlin. This is Berlin. At a Foreign Office press conference this morning, the tentative limits of the total blockade against Great Britain were outlined. A line has been drawn on the maps, starting from the mouth of the Loire River in France and encircling the British Isles, and ending at a point on the Belgian coast. Whether or not the Irish Free State is to be blockaded is a matter yet to be decided. At the Foreign Office this morning, it was announced that negotiations are now in progress between the representatives of the German and the Irish Free State governments regarding the future limits and operations of the blockade against England. Berlin is waiting for a proposal from the Irish about the blockade. And the spokesman added that the German government would permit, if requested, Irish ships flying Irish Free State flags to enter certain pre-designated harbors in the Free State by certain lanes and at certain times. In less than 24 hours since the total blockade was announced, three neutral ships have been sunk. They were the 2,300-ton Swedish steamer, the Hedron, and two Greek freighters, the 4,000-ton Thetis, and the 3,500-ton Naphthalos. The High Command communique has just been released, and here are some of its high points. The mining of British waters continued yesterday, along with reconnaissance and attacking flights. We are told the German plane, German planes bomb motor factories at Filton, F-I-L-T-O-N, in Wales, Airplane factories at Birmingham and industrial plants at Reading. In Swansea, Avonlith, and Bournemouth were also bombed during the day. Also, the Germans claimed that airports in South and Central England were attacked by German raiders. And we were told that Brussels was bombed yesterday by the British, but we have no details. The Polish Governor General, Dr. Frank, made a speech the other day about the Aryanization of the city of Krakow. This is to be the new captain of the Governor General, and in consequence, Dr. Frank announced that it will be completely freed of Jews. Any Jews remaining on will be forced to compulsory labor, he said in his speech. And speaking of Krakow, he declared, quote, it would be an impossible situation if a representative of the Germany of Adolf Hitler should be established in a town so overcrowded by Jews that a decent man would rather walk in the streets. And it is clear that herewith a serious warning must be given. The Jews must vanish from the face of Europe. End of quote. And then discussing the work of the Germans in Poland, he pointed out that their task was very difficult because there are 10 million people who are not members of the National Socialist Party. But he said that these 10 million Poles are waiting for German leadership. When the Germans conquered France, they also won another victory. We read in the textile Zeitung. The Dr. Otto Jung writes that henceforth, Germany will be the fashion capital of New York, and not Paris. Dr. Jung doesn't like the general professions throughout the world, but for centuries, Paris was the fashion capital, and he scoffs at the idea. He writes, quote, The victory of Greater Germany will be at the same time the realization of the right to lead in the cultural development of fashion. A German taste will lead, end of quote. <clears throat> Dr. Jung, however, was writing about fashion in general, and he did not indicate who would be the Schiaparellis, the Molinos of the New York. We learned here this week that one of the famous castles in Thuringia, the Schwarzburg, is to be given to Herr Hitler as a prison of the people in the province. And the great victory is won over England. The castle at the, at the present time is being completely renovated. This is Edwin Hartrich, a returning out of Columbia in New York. And now for the report of Edward Morrow in Britain's capital, go ahead, London. This is London. German bombers are over this country as I speak. The air raid sirens sounded in London early this afternoon. 
and is now about two o'clock in London. No official announcement has yet been made. The German raiders were seen to cross the southeast coast and disappear inland with Royal Air Force fighters in hot pursuit. Since Friday, German raids on this country have been on a restricted scale. But last night, districts in England and Wales were bombed. There were a few civilian casualties. Two flights of German planes penetrated the air defenses of the southeast coast before dawn this morning, each flight consisting of nine to 12 planes. They dropped nine whistling bombs and then retreated back across the channel when patrolling British fighters spotted them. Those German planes, which are now flying over England, came across the coast at a very high altitude, apparently because the skies overhead lacked sufficient clouds to cover their advance toward their objectives. The press of London plays the acceptance speech of Wendell Wilkie very guardedly this morning and almost without comment. There is no doubt that they are not displeased with Mr. Wilkie's attitude of aid for Britain, but they have found nothing in his speech to cheer in large print. Generally, they have depended on very objective American agency reports of his speech yesterday. This morning, Londoners were surprised to read in their papers that the German radio reported a dark pall of smoke over the British capital. From a high point in the center of London, no such pall of smoke could be seen in any direction. The London area bombed represents only a tiny fraction of this sprawling mass of streets and houses. Nine-tenths of the inhabitants saw no more and heard no more of the air raids on South and East London than you did in America. They had to tune in their radios or go out and buy a paper to discover what had happened. When masses of planes bombed Belgium and northern France, whole towns were deserted and refugees packed the roads. Masses of planes have bombed England, but nothing like that has happened. For one thing, there's no place to flee to where bombers won't come. For another, there's no immediate fear of German tanks following the bombers a few miles back. That's why the countryside and towns of England after heavy bombing bear no resemblance to the scenes in Belgium and in France. In the days following the collapse of France, correspondents were able to go down to the coasts of Britain and come back to write stories headed from the front. That's no longer possible. There's only one front now, and that's wherever the bombs happen to fall. For the past two days, there haven't been many bombs. In six days of attacks increasing in volume and in area covered, the German Air Force lost, according to British figures, 492 airplanes and 1,240 men. In the same engagements, that is over Britain, the Royal Air Force reports loss of only 115 aircraft and 69 men. To this figure must be added the loss of 31 British bombers and about 130 men in raids against Germany. British losses on the ground as a result of the bombing of airfields must be included, but these are claimed to be small. It is apparent that the determined German bombing of the British airfields near the coast has two purposes. First, to kill Air Force personnel on the ground. Second, to pock the fields with bomb craters so that the British fighters have difficulty in taking off. They need a long run to get off the ground. If these forward aerodromes can be immobilized, then the British fighters will have to work from inland aerodromes, thus limiting the length of time they can remain in the air. Their high-speed cruising limit is only a little over one hour. If the British fighters have to fly 50 or 100 miles from inland England to meet the German planes over the coast, flying from aerodromes only 25 or 30 miles away in France, the British pilots will soon be worn out from the necessity of repeated landings in order to refuel. Various explanations are being advanced for yesterday's lull in area warfare over this island. The Germans may be reorganizing and reforming their squadrons, perhaps waiting for full reports on the extent of the damage done during last week's raid. Or they may be hoping that a day or two's inactivity will create more apprehension and nervousness in this country by causing people to ponder and speculate on the heavier raids to come. The German reputation for invincibility is at stake, and the effect upon neutral opinion if they were to suspend or greatly reduce their attacks, would be considerable. So we may expect to hear more of German bombers before long. I return you now to CBS in New York. And now for the report of Cecil Brown in Italy's capital. Go ahead, Rome. This is Rome. The third Italian column operating in British Tomorrowland is on the move toward Deborah. The bulletin of the Italian High Command issued two hours ago reveals that a column from Zaira has occupied the town of Bulhar. Two other columns are pushing northward from Berbera. The communications at Mandera, a large detachment of Indian troops, ran away after sighting fascist scouting detachments. Italian planes have been raiding Berbera, and the communique reports one of them has not returned to its base. 
British ships in the Mediterranean heavily bombarded the Italian base of Bardi on the coast of Libya. More than 300 shells of large and medium caliber were fired against Bardia and the hinterland. However, the Italians say only one soldier was killed and 11 injured during the action. Italian fighter planes immediately went up to attack the British ships and the planes supporting them. The communique says seven Gloucester fighters were shot down for certain and two others probably destroyed. Three Italian planes are missing. The High Command revealed today that Italian submarines are operating on the ocean side of Gibraltar. The communique says a 9,000-ton British tanker has been torpedoed in the Atlantic. The heaviest ground action is the offensive against the second line of enemy defenses in British Samara land. It's indicated here that the Italians are pounding away on the northern side of the Yerato Pass for the final attack in their drive to Berbera. Yerato Pass was conquered yesterday. As the news comes in here, strong units of fascists are pushing from the, <clears throat> from the Erato Pass toward Hamas. Another column is to the east of Hamas and is said to be fighting its way toward that point. Hamas is 25 miles from Berber. The indications are the two columns which came up from Ethiopia are to converge at Hamas and, with the column advancing from Zaire, attack Berber from two sides. The Italian High Command last night broke precedent and issued two war bulletins in one day. The second communique announced that the English had been beaten at the Yarato Pass and had fled to their second fortified position. The Italians believe if they crush this resistance, it will be a virtual march through to Berber. The capital of Berber would give the Italians complete control of about one-fourth of British Samara land. But the area already taken is considered the best defended part. If Berber falls, it is thought here that the British will pull all their forces out of the colony and take to their transport ships. The battle for the Aerotel Pass was the biggest Anglo-Italian ground engagement in Africa since the war started. The Italian victory convinces the Rome papers this morning that the British cannot hold their second fortification. In fact, the Popolo di Roma goes so far as to announce that British Samara van no longer exists. A slice of the British Empire, says the paper, has passed to Italy. It was revealed here today that French officers and pilots, as well as airplanes from Prince de Marovan, right next door, are helping the British defenders. Governor Jean Terrot of the French colony went over to the British, it said, soon after the Franco-Italian armistice. He was joined by the commander of the French forces at Djibouti, as well as other staff officers. The papers here foresee great success for the announced German blockade of the British Isles. Virginia Guide in the Voce d'Italia says the, blo the total blockade must signify the complete isolation of Britain. Guide also points out that there is no doubt the coming days will see Germany using greater force and even stronger means against Britain. Stephanie, the Italian news agency, reports that it is to the interest of four-fifths of the world to break English hegemony. Only Britain, Stephanie says, is in the way of world peace. If England is crushed, Stephanie explains, it is therefore in the interest of the whole world. When the Wilkie's speech of acceptance didn't create much of a stir in the fascist press today. The papers here report that Wilkie expressed sympathy for England and deplored the provocative policy of President Roosevelt against foreign powers. powers. The fascist press quoted Wilkie as saying Roosevelt had imperiled the good international relations of the United States. And that's the extent of the report here on Wilkie's speech. This is Cecil Brown in Rome, returning you to CBS in New York. And that's the latest news as reported by Columbia's correspondents in the belligerent capitals of Europe. This morning, Edwin Hartridge reported from Berlin, Edward Morrow from London, and Cecil Brown from Rome. George Bryan speaking.